So welcome everybody. We are really excited to have you in class today. Today is our kickoff of the new school year. And it's also the class all about the Constitutional Convention. So what a great topic for the week of this week of September, because Friday, September 17th, is the anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution. We call it Constitution Day, and we celebrate it across the nation, um, and other countries come and check out what we're doing as well. So there's so much to learn about what led us to the Constitutional Convention, what did they do at the Constitutional Convention, and then what are some of the implications from that Constitutional Convention? And Tom, really, that's the start of our conversation today. So with you today, I am Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer. And I love to hear your questions and your dialogue in the chat. So please feel free to do that. And we are also here with Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the center. So Tom, I just laid out for you the big questions. Could you introduce yourself, say hi to the students and kind of kick us off? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm a senior fellow uh, for constitutional studies at the National Constitution Center. Excited here for Constitution Week to talk about the Constitutional Convention. And Curry, I'm sure you have some, some questions to help frame our discussion. Yeah, and it really is about trying to understand why did the founding generation decide or want or why do they need a constitution? What were we doing before the constitution and that Articles of Confederation? And then as our students already asked, what were the major debates, discussions and compromises and the heated ones as well that happened at the convention? But Tom, you know the way we like to do it at the Constitution Center better than anybody else. We like to start off with a big idea that we want all of our students to walk away with and then dive deep into the Constitution. Because if we don't know what we're talking about, we really shouldn't be talking about how it came to exist and what's in the Constitution. That's great. Yeah, let's kick off the big idea here and the thing to just keep in mind throughout the discussion is that with the US Constitution, the founding generation established a new national government. And as we think about this, this new government, it was more powerful than the national government created by the Articles of Confederation, which was already in place when we held the Constitutional Convention, but it was also a national government of limited powers. And so we'll return again and again to this idea of the founding generation and the founders there at the Constitutional Convention trying to find sort of a middle space between two extremes, um, sometimes in, in, you know, to great effect and sometimes to compromises that we look back on today with anguish. So it's not as though compromise is always a good thing necessarily. But and I don't know if you want to jump in, Curry, or should we get to the Constitution itself? I think that's great. I just wanted to echo that. I think when we talk about compromise, we mostly always think that's a good thing. But you're right. There are compromises happen at the Constitutional Convention that we are debating and discussing in our day-to-day -day lives, in our country's lives. So they are really compromises that some people will look upon as necessary, and then some people will look upon as an evil that should have never happened. And I think that's so important to pop up point out compromise is not always a good thing and can be really questioned. But yes, let's start with the Constitution and those beautiful three little words that kick us off. So students, type into the chat real quick for us. What are the three words that kick off the Constitution? And Tom will tell us a little bit about popular sovereignty as you guess those three. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, the, the Constitution begins with, in many ways, its most inspiring passage. And those three key words, as we see in the chat box, we, the people, and one of these words embodying above all, they're embodying one of the key principles of the Constitution itself, popular sovereignty, which is just a fancy way of saying that our Constitution establishes a government that's driven by us, not a king, not the elite, not the aristocracy, but by us, the American people. So that's popular sovereignty, that's we, the people, that's the preamble. So then as we look at the rest of the Constitution, we'll take a brisk jog through it right now. And there are seven articles to that original Constitution crafted in Philadelphia. The first three lay out the three branches of government. So this is Articles 1, 2, and 3 to the Constitution. Article 1 ends up establishing Congress. And so it's the legislative branch of the government, and it's tasked with making the laws. We'll talk a bit more about Congress later. But here, the key thing to note is that Congress ends up being divided into two houses, the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. The fancy word for this is bicameralism, but that's Congress. Article two then establishes the executive branch, and it's led by a single president responsible for enforcing the laws. And the founding generation here, they were looking to craft an executive officer that was not as powerful as the kings of Europe, but it was more powerful than the governors in their state, in their state governments at the time. So again, trying to find a middle passageway between a king 
and a state governor. And then finally, Article Three establishes the judicial branch headed by a Supreme Court. Uh, and it has the duty of the Supreme Court and the federal courts to, their duty is to interpret the laws. And so here are the two big ideas that we see within the judicial branch. One, judicial independence. So the constitution grants federal judges life tenure, which means they hold their jobs until either they die or impeached or removed or resigned. But this allows them some insulation from politics. The other is that we give our judges the power of judicial review. And this is that power to look at laws, look at the constitution and decide whether a law is constitutional or unconstitutional. That's articles one through three, Curry. And that's great because some of our students, Matthew was already asking about judicial review and kind of what was in those pieces um, and, and how was the, the courts actually spelled out. So great questions coming through the chat and I'm gonna weave them as we go through. And I love article one, two and three and breaking it out just as its own because that's the three branches of government right there. We have Congress, we have the executive and we have judicial and it really sets up that three powerful branches. But there's so much more in the original or structural constitution. There is There are four more articles and they do a lot. And Article 5 is my favorite. So can you walk the students through the next four articles? Absolutely. So Article 4 is a bit of a hodgepodge. But what it gives us, it, it tells us a little bit about the relationship between the states and their citizens. It tells us how we're going to handle the admission of new states and also how we're going to govern federal territories. This provision also includes the infamous Fugitive Slave Clause. So that's Article 4. Article 5, as Curry said, her favorite uh, it lays out the amendment process. It tells us how we can change the Constitution. What's so cool about that provision is it shows us the founding generation, though brilliant, didn't believe they had all the answers. They wanted to make sure they had a process in place where we can improve the Constitution over time based on what we learned. So that's Article 5. It allows us to amend the Constitution. Article 6 establishes the supremacy of natural law over the laws of the states. Uh, and so the, th this is what makes the Constitution the highest law in the land. And then it also, interestingly, Article 6 bans religious tests for national office. So already we see certain protections for freedom of conscience, even in the original Constitution itself. And then finally, Article 7, which is one of my favorites, lays out the process for ratifying the Constitution. This is how the American people can say yes or no to the document. It doesn't matter that George Washington signed it, Benjamin Franklin signed it, James Madison signed it, that it was written there in Philadelphia by these great figures during the Constitutional Convention. In the end, they said the decision rests with the American people whether to say yes or no to the new constitution through state ratifying conventions, state by state. That's popular sovereignty. Back to we the people, it's up to you. Here's your document on September 17th, it's handed to the people and says, this is your document to choose to sign it or to not. I think that's huge, it's unbelievable. I know we love Akhil Amar, but that's the first time I ever really learned that was Akhil. And he's saying it's given back to the people, back to the people and that creates a ripple effect a through the world, democracy is in the power of the people. And I absolutely love that. But it wasn't an easy road to get here. So we get to this great, you know, constitution. We have so many parts in it. There's compromises that are not so great we'll talk about. But there, we were in a big, big turmoil. We were at a point of desperation that we were almost losing it all. We were living under the Articles of Confederation. And I know our students, if they're using their worksheet, they're looking at like at least four reasons why the articles didn't work. But Tom, can you quickly walk us through what were the Articles of Confederation? Why weren't they working? And how it led to Shays Rebellion? Absolutely. So the Articles of Confederation, that's the national framework of government that we had before the Constitution. It's in place as the delegates are meeting at the Constitutional Convention. And the one thing to realize about the Articles is that it creates a weak national government. It's a weak government. The government doesn't, the national government doesn't have the power to do things like tax, to tax. It doesn't have the power to regulate trade between the various states. So it has, it ends up being a weak framework of government. The organization of it itself also is strange from the perspective of the constitution we just walked through in that the Articles of Confederation, it's all run by a single Congress. So it's a single house of Congress does everything. There's no separate executive branch. There's no separate judicial branch. And so, and there's only one house of Congress, not two. And so structurally it's very different than the constitution we get in Philadelphia. But because of this weak framework of government, we see a series of problems. We see a national government that can't fund itself. How does it, how does it get funding? Well, it has to ask 
asked the states for money. You could imagine how well that worked. He had forced the states or the citizens to pay up. It has to ask the states and they have to voluntarily give up money. So we can't fund the government. We can't fund the troops. The national government itself can't force the states to provide troops to defend the nation. So we can't defend our frontiers. We see the states themselves, these state governments, where they're all they all have their own governments, they all have their own state constitutions, and they're all protecting their own territory. They have their own, they have their own military forces that can protect themselves, but they also are putting up barriers to trade between the states, which undermines the economy of the nation. And so as the framers are, are, are marching towards Philadelphia, there are two things that we see here, two things that they're really responding to. One are these flaws that we see in the Articles of Confederation, this weak national government, this government that's actually, it's a lot more like the states are a bunch of independent states rather than a single United States of America. Most political power is held by independent states at this point in time. And the other then are the, these flaws that the framers see in the state constitutions themselves with state governments that give too much power to the state legislature, not enough power to governors or the state courts that are doing things like undermining property rights. And that in the end, many people perceive as really undermining the economy and security of the nation as a whole. And so we see, I'll, I'll sort of pause there, Curry, before we get to Shays Rebellion. Yeah, and one of our students from Great Valley asked a really good question. And I, I feel like this is such a great question because we always bash the Articles of Confederation, but there was something good going on at this time too. We talk about it, you know, it's falling apart, but, and the state constitutions are, are have weaknesses, but there's also something experimental and fascinating to watch kind of bubbling up from these separate, they're almost like separate countries. When we talk about a loose league of friendship, each state is able to kind of grow in different ways. So what it's, the question was, was there anything positive about the Articles of Confederation? Oh, absolutely. This is such an exciting moment. And, and it's almost because of the frame of the class, we have to focus on the downside. But this period between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitutional Convention is one of the great experiments in democracy in world history. For the, I mean, for the Americans, it's so exciting after the Declaration of Independence, every state is called on to create a new government. And so the leaders in the states are excited. They get to form state constitutions, experiment with different forms of government. And there's great optimism that the American project is going to work, that we're gonna create re little republics throughout the nation, that we can weave it together through this ultimate na national government through the Articles of Confederation, leaving most powers with the states, but allowing the American people to still come together in the Confederation Congress the same way they did throughout the American Revolution. So there was great optimism. The main problem, one of the main problems with the Articles, and the last one I'll say before getting to Shays' Rebellion, was that whether you supported a new constitution or not, everyone saw the flaws in the Articles of Confederation. And so again, the founding generation, one of their greatest features was they were children of the enlightenment. They wanted to learn from history. And they wanted to learn from experience. And many people saw these problems with the Articles of Confederation. We just talked about the problem was that to amend the articles, it required every state to agree. The amendment process for the Articles of Confederation required unanimity. And as a result, not once did the Confederation Congress approve an amendment despite everyone really seeing these flaws in the Articles of Confederation. One more question, and everybody's doing awesome in the chat with sharing parts about what made it work, what made it not work. Um, one question, another question from Great Valley School is, when the articles were created, who or whom had the greatest say in the wording? So we talk so much about Madison. We talk so much about the, the people that we're going to come up with, with the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. But who is kind of the lead pen on the articles? Well, there are two people to focus on. One is, in many ways, this flows out of an idea from 1754, so decades earlier, from Benjamin Franklin. He put together the first plan for a national government called the Albany Plan, which would end up being a model for the Articles of Confederation. But the actual, if we're looking at who is the primary author of the Articles of Confederation, it's John Dickinson. Um, uh, ends up being the, the pen person of, of, the, uh, of the Articles. Of course, a key figure during the, you know, the road to the American Revolution, and then also a key figure during the Constitutional Convention. And one of our favorites at the NCC. So real quickly, Shays' Rebellion, so many of our students know about Shays' Rebellion, and I like to point it out as one of the many case studies of how we, an example of how we are falling apart. And that will lead us to the reasons they come to a constitutional convention to fix these articles, but to also ensure that we are safe. So tell us what happens in Shays' Rebellion and kind of how it gives energy to the constitutional convention. Yeah, so this is fast forwarding to 1786. 
We see an economic situation that's in, 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 in turmoil. We see businesses failing, trade suffering. A lot of the flaws we already talked about are flowing and creating a sense of crisis in America. And the problem is that the Articles of Confederation themselves create a government that's too weak to address these problems. And so we end up with Shays' Rebellion. So who is Daniel Shays? Well, he's a veteran of the American Revolution. He fought in Lexington. He fought at Bunker Hill. And here with Shays Rebellion, he's leading a bunch of farmers from Western Massachusetts who are angry about the current situation. They have massive debts. There's a threat of them losing their farms. And they feel that the elite, the governing elite in Boston, in the Massachusetts state government doesn't speak for them. And so they march and they march across Massachusetts. Along the way, they close down courthouses. They close down debtors prisons. They look to arm themselves at the arsenal in Springfield, Massachusetts. They're going to march across the state and go to Boston and say, Massachusetts state government, you must hear us. And this ends up being an extraordinary moment because in the end, it's not the national government that puts down this rebellion. It's a Massachusetts militia. Because again, the Confederation Congress under the Articles of Confederation doesn't really have the power to raise the military force necessary to put down this rebellion. And so this is this moment that creates great dread among people like George Washington, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, they look at this and they say, if a national government can't stop this farmer's rebellion, how are we going to be a great nation? And so there's this threat of mob rule. There's this thought that this this may be only the first of many violent rebellions and we need a national government that can do two big things here. One is that when there's a threat of mob rule could actually project military force and stop it, that that's a job for the national government. But the other is that we want a national government they can actually address the genuine concerns of the people, the genuine national concerns. It, need, it doesn't need to be an unlimited government, an all-powerful government, but it does have to be a government that's stronger than the one created by the Articles of Confederation and one that can address genuinely national problems. So that brings them to uh, fixing the Articles, but ensuring that by fixing the Articles, they can shore up the economy and keep it thriving and to keep it safe. And so when we talk about, you know, keeping people safe and we talk about mob rule, there's also an underlying fear and discussion around this fear of slave insurrections as well. Is that another kind of piece to it? It absolutely is. That is certainly for some of the delegates what they have in mind. I mean, the other thing about Shays' Rebellion is this is happening in Massachusetts, which for the founding generation, they look at the Massachusetts state constitution and they say, that's one of the really good ones. So it was really scary to them that even in a state that they saw having a good structure of government, that there's all of this unrest. So it really was quite alarming. So they come to the Constitutional Convention. Let's go through it. Like, who comes who refuses to come? So who comes and why do they come? And who refuses to come? And they come with this, like, a word, the sole purpose of proposing and revising the articles. But you know what? The reality is most of them were like, oh, we are chucking those articles on day one and we're moving <laughs> forwards. It's not like that's a hidden secret. Some of them really came to, to rewrite a new constitution. So I'll give everybody the image because we love playing this um, Where's Waldo game where you can look and figure out who's who. And Tom will tell us, like, the people who came to this convention, the men who came to this convention, who are they, what are they like, and who shows up and who doesn't show up? Because so often we look at this and everybody starts thinking the guy is in the Declaration of Independence, Um, but some of those guys aren't there. So tell us a little bit about the the moment of May 25th, 1787, when they get a quorum in Philadelphia. Yeah, absolutely. So the convention itself, it's meeting in Philadelphia, it's meeting in secret. So that's one thing we can we can ask ourselves why they might be meeting in secret. It, it, it meets from May until September 17th, 1787. So the Constitution's crafted in a, under 100 working days, which is kind of extraordinary given everything that they had to do there. You know, who are some of the big figures that are there in the convention hall? We could see them in the picture. George Washington at the front of the room, he's there. Benjamin Franklin sitting there in that wonderful leisure suit that he's wearing in that the blue one there in the chair. And so this is also very, very important. What this tells people is these are the two most beloved figures in America. And so it tells people that something important is happening here. There are serious problems and serious people are taking them seriously. And it took a lot to get George Washington into the room. I mean, one of the great accomplishments of James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, who you also see in the room in this picture, was convincing George Washington, no, 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 General Washington, you have to be there. Only then is this project actually going to work. So they're there. Who isn't there? Well, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, they're not there. They're actually serving America. Uh, Jefferson's in France. John Adams is in England. 
Um, John Hancock, famous from his big signature in the Declaration of Independence, he's in Massachusetts serving as governor. There's also key revolutionaries, though, who are skeptical of a new and powerful national government. So Virginian figures like Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. He's not there. Richard Henry Lee, they're not there. So some key figures skeptical of national power, not in the room. Now, how do the delegates end up there? Well, they're selected by their state legislatures. And then within the convention itself, and this is notable, every state gets one vote. So whether you're a humongous state with a big population like Virginia or a small state with a small population like Connecticut, every state gets a single vote. Rhode Island sends no delegates. They, 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 they again, they're another group. They, they fear national power. So they don't want any part of this project at all. Frankly, New York isn't represented for much of the convention because Robert Yates and John Lansing, two of their delegates say, no, 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 no. What they're doing here, it's illegal, it's illegitimate. Congress said we should only be amending the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, not creating a new constitution. We're out of here. And so you see sort of some people there, some people not. Finally, one thing noting, these are also fairly young people. So George, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin, he's in his 80s, but the average age of the delegates, 42. Most of them are lawyers. Um, and then finally, Curry are, you know, in many ways, we, we love talking about them. There's also figures who stay to the end of the convention, participate the whole time, debate vigorously, have their own strong ideas, but at the end decide we can't sign this constitution. And so these are three dissenters, George Mason, Elbridge Gary, and Edmund Randolph, who at the end of the convention say, you know, we've gone, we've gone through a lot together, but we cannot sign this document. And so again, establishing at the very beginning, at the very foundation of the constitution, the importance of dissent. And I think it, it's important to talk about dissent for people who were there the entire time, but also this idea that, you know, at the end, we see 39 signatures on that document, but over the course of that summer, 70, I think it's 75 people were in and out. So when others came in and like almost like tapped in and tapped out from their state, were they also elected like by their state legislators or were, was it kind of a, I know like some states were trying to figure out how to ensure that these people had funding to go. Um, so there is, one of the students asked about like, is this like the elite that's going? And in a way the state legislators are the elite and the people who were able to afford to leave their homes and their businesses for months are absolutely the elite as well. Can you give us a little bit more about that context? Yeah, so certainly these are significant political heavyweights. And as of, you know, they are largely political and economic elites. Um, no matter, you know, the people who are coming in, they are selected by their state legislatures. Often the state legislatures are instructing their delegates to say, you can only agree to this and not that. And so there are some constraints as to what those figures can do. But even just thinking about someone like Alexander Hamilton, He's so interesting because he pops in and out of the convention. He's there at the end. He signs the Constitution. But at that point in time, New York doesn't even have a quorum because they don't have the other delegates there. And so although Alexander Hamilton's there and can participate in the debate, New York itself can't vote because they don't have enough delegates there. So it's like this very interesting, uh, interesting dynamic you see at play. And one of the students brought up that question again. They, they meet over this long, hot, smelly, sweaty summer in Philadelphia with the windows closed, they, you know, if you've ever been to Philadelphia and you look at what was at the Pennsylvania State House at the time, we now call it Independence Hall, it, they put manure and straw down all around the Belgium block, around the building and closed the shutters, which it, it sounds super like, why did they do that? They wanted it quiet. They didn't want to disturb the delegates, but they also wanted it in secret. So what was the reason why they did it in secret? What was the value of that? Well, they, they thought that the best way to have good debate, good reason, civil dialogue was one, what you're saying there, Curry, is like they want, a, they want a quiet environment where people could deliberate. But the other is that they didn't want to, they, 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 they thought that secrecy would allow people to be more honest, more open, perhaps to be more open to changing their minds. And they mm. thought that there were certain deliberative virtues there within the convention itself, that if you just had people coming out, in and out of the convention, things, pamphlets, newspapers, everything swirling about with rumors of what's being said inside, that the deliberation inside the convention wouldn't be quite as good. And I think that's really important because they did this voting where you would vote on an issue 
and any delegate in the future could bring it back up and go back to it. So there was this really interesting systematic kind of teamwork there. And to think about how sometimes debate doesn't go so well on social media, you can kind of understand that as we reverse engineer it, how it could work really well in secrecy, but it's not so transparent. The building, the making of the constitution isn't as transparent as people like to kind of think it is, the adoption of it is. So let's dive into what they debated and what were some heated comp compromises that they made during the convention. Absolutely. So let's start. So there, there are four we have up there, the Connecticut Compromise, the Electoral College, and then the two big compromises over slavery, the Three-Fifths Compromise and the Slave Trade Clause. We'll try to tick through each. Let's begin with the Connecticut or Great Compromise. So here, you know, one of the questions before we started class was what was, you know, what were the most contentious or what are the most contentious debates at the convention? For the delegates, this was one of the big ones. It was over how to structure Congress and how you're going to structure political power within Congress. And so this ends up putting, pitting uh, large states, states with a lot of people against small states, states with not as many people. And so the big symbol here are the two big plans that end up being debated at the convention. The first is the Virginia plan which is presented at the beginning of the convention. It's the ideas of James Madison largely. And for our purposes, the key idea in the Virginia plan was that we're gonna have a state, we're gonna have a national legislature. It's gonna be a Congress. It's gonna have two houses. So the Articles of Confederation remember just one house. Well, Madison says, no, no, we want two houses. We wanna divide power between, because we're concerned that Congress is gonna to have too much power. So we're gonna divide it into two houses and we're gonna organize those houses around population. And so if the larger states are going to get more seats, the smaller states are going to get fewer seats. So political power will go to the large states and not to the small states. Needless to say, these small states were not happy with this plan. What they saw was like, this is very self-interested. In the end, who's going to dominate government then? Big states like Virginia, who's presenting the Virginia plan. And so we have the small states come forth with what's called the New Jersey plan. It's authored by William Patterson. And effectively what the New Jersey plan does, it gives some new powers to the national government. So it deals with some of the, the, the uh, critiques that people had of the Articles of Confederation, but it keeps that key feature of the Articles of Confederation of equal representation of the states. Every state in, the, in, in Congress will get an equal vote, whether you're a big state like Virginia or a small state like Connecticut, or in this case, New Jersey. And so you have the big states against the large states. And then what's uh, big states against the small states. And what's the Connecticut compromise? Well, it's Connecticut's Roger Sherman coming forth, brokering a compromise and saying, one, basically one side gets one house and one side gets the other. So we have a US House of Representatives organized by population. So that's like the Virginia plan, big states, populous states getting more seats than smaller states. And then we have a Senate that has equal representation of the state. So every state, whether it's a big state or a small state, gets two senators. That's the Connecticut Compromise. It only wins by a single vote. So it's not as though everyone came together and thought this was a great idea. James Madison thought it was a terrible idea. He was so mad that he lost this particular debate. But in the end, we get a Congress with two houses, so that's bicameralism, a U.S. House based on population, and a Senate based on equal state power. So we're looking at the four, some of these big compromises. This, it, this is heated, but it's not one of the most heated, right? Correct. Okay, so let's go into the debates over the presidency. And I know it always makes me laugh that one of the first, you know, speeches at the convention is Hamilton going off about basically how the presidency should be a monarch. And he goes for like a four hour speech. And then everybody's like, no, we're not going to even like we're, we're just ending it now. And we're not listening to you. So what are some of the debates around the presidency? Yeah, so the big debate, so the framers really struggled with the presidency. And part of the reason why is they couldn't find an example of what they were really looking for. So they looked to Europe, they saw powerful kings, they looked to their states, they saw weak governors. They themselves had revolted against King George III. He, they hated his royal, go their royal governors and royal officials. And so they didn't really want to just do the revolution and then create this new government with a distant, powerful executive. So they tried to find something in between those two extremes. You know, you're right, Alexander Hamilton, John Dickinson, they supported a strong executive. They kind of liked the limited monarchy of Great Britain. They wanted a single strong executive. On the other hand, there were people like Connecticut's Roger Sherman, who basically just wanted the Congress to run everything. And so we thought the, the president really should be, quote, nothing more than an institution for carrying the will of the legislature into effect. So in the end, the, the delegates end up debating four big issues. How are they going to elect a president? How long the president's term should be? Whether the president should be allowed to run for re-election? And the question of impeachment and removal. In the end, you know, just focusing on one of those, how are we going to elect a president? They went back and forth. 
So you have figures like, like uh, uh, Pennsylvania's James Wilson saying, let's just have a national popular vote. Wasn't strong support for that in the convention, but, but Wilson fought hard for that one. Many, many delegates thought that the president should be selected by Congress. The reasoning being that co the people of Congress, they are the best informed people in the country. Why shouldn't they select the president? Um, but then the critique there being what uh, Governor Morris, for instance, said, one of the delegates to the convention said is, if you put it all on Congress, you're going to have cabal, you're going to have conspiracy. The president's just going to be dependent on Congress. And we want a president that can be independent. It's Congress that's going to be the most powerful branch. We need a strong and independent president. So that was the vote by congressional, uh, a congressional election of president. The final idea, though, was a compromise. It's the electoral college. It's what we end up with. And this is the idea that we're going to have a separate body of electors selected by, in the end, people voting in the states for these electors. And then these electors get together and vote for the president in December. Um, and so it ends up being a compromise where someone like a James Wilson can look at the electoral college and say, this is the closest I'm going to get to a national popular election. And he makes the prediction that over time, the process is going to become more democratic. And so it's going to get closer and closer to his idea. And you know what? History proved him right on that front. The flip side is that those who support a congressional election of president suspected that the American people would never agree on any particular person to become president. As a result, because under the Constitution that would then go to the House of Representatives, they get congressional election by other means. But the Electoral College ends up being a compromise between those two sides, Chris. Now, two big debates that happen next are both around enslavement and the enslavement of people. And would you consider this some of the most, I mean, when we study history, we hear about that the debates and the battles over slavery at the convention almost tore the convention apart, that this is where the South said, the deep South said, we're going to leave if you don't, if you try to end slavery now in this document. So would you consider this some of the most heated battles at the convention? Oh, absolutely. Where there's big flashpoints over slavery squarely is some of the strongest language. Here's, for instance, Mar Maryland's Luther Martin, who was an anti-slavery voice. He called slavery, quote, inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the American character. Governor Morris called it a nefarious institution, the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. But at the same time, you're right, Curry. You would have figures like South Carolina's John Rutledge say, you know, if you put any restrictions on enslavement, if you end the international slave trade, we're out of this convention, we're out of this union. And so there's great flashpoints between the slaveholding delegates and you know, some of the anti-slavery voices inside the convention. And so there are compromises and there are dangerous compromises that shift power over time to the South. So one of the biggest is the three-fifths compromise. So you, can you walk us through, and students, we're gonna wrap up in about three minutes, but we do have an extended class on slavery in the Constitution coming up in a few weeks that we will dive into this deeper because it is such a interesting, tr tremendously sad, but also fascinating conversation to look at what it does over time and how it affects us. So three-fifths compromise and the slave trade clause. Absolutely. So the three-fifths compromise, this is all about growing out of the great compromise, the question of how do we count enslaved people for purposes of deciding how many seats a state gets in the House of Representatives? And so you have slaveholding delegates, especially from the deep south, like South Carolina and Georgia, say, count enslaved people as a full person, as five-fifths. So we should get more political power in Congress based on how many enslaved people that we hold. So that's the argument from the deep south. We want, we want five fifths, we want enslaved people to count as five fifths of a, as a, of a person. On the flip side, you see many anti-slavery delegates say, no, 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 no. Enslaved people, you do not, you, do not, you yourselves, slaveholding states, do not count enslaved people as full people. You don't grant them any rights. Therefore, for purposes of deciding how many seats you get, you don't get a bonus for the number of enslaved people you hold. Enslaved people, for purposes of how many seats you get in Congress, they should count as zero-fifths of a person. We think they count as five-fifths of a person and should get rights, but you are not giving them any, and therefore you get no political power. So five-fifths, zero-fifths. Again, it ends up being Connecticut's Roger Sherman helping to broker a compromise between the two sides and saying that enslaved people, for purposes of how number of seats in the House of Representatives, they're going to count as three-fifths of a person. So somewhere in between the, the zero fifths and the five fifths. But this ends up creating a, an important uh, effect over time on political power in our national government. Because what this effectively does is it boosts the amount of political power that slaveholding states get in Congress. 
So it gives them greater number of seats because the enslaved people count as three fifths of a person because the number of seats, a number of votes you get in the electoral college is determined by how many seats in Congress you have. It then boosts the slaveholding voices in the electoral college resulting in greater political power over who becomes president. And then those presidents decide who sits on the Supreme Court. So you see this political compromise expanding the political power of the slaveholding states across all three branches of government. Yeah, and I think that is, an unbelievable what when you count an enslaved person as three fifths it is giving power to that state to the leadership in that state in the government it does you know we're not talking about having three fifths of rights of citizenry yes. all those pieces and i i know for some of our students kind of diving into this for the first time i need to almost clearly say that out because like wait did you get some rights yes. um just like you know and no you don't and that's we just want to separate that it's giving power to the the leaders and the government of that state as representation so if you more yeah, voices, and governor moore governor moore during these debates specifically says he says upon what principle is it that the enslaved person should be computed in the representation are they meant to do that, then they should not be part of your representation in Congress. And it's a, I love that part. And Governor Morris is a fascinating person to dive into. So Matthew asked a great question. How much were the founders able to foresee the effects of the three-fifths clause? And I, I, that's a, I love that question. Like, we see that with the 14th Amendment and the, the loophole in the 13th Amendment, that like we see people that say, mm, this is going to cause a problem. Do we see that at this time? Do we see that? that fear of the power shift that could happen? So yes and no. I mean, certainly some of the anti-slavery delegates foresaw the political effects of this. At the same time, you saw plenty of even the, the critics of slavery at the convention believed slavery was going to die out as an institution. It was already dying out in the North, and the idea was it wasn't going to work economically, and so even the South would eventually reform. And here's Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut. He said, slavery in time will not be a speck in our country. But because of innovations like the cotton gin, among other things, slavery itself became more and more entrenched in the economy and then the political power of the nation. So some foresaw it, but many of them predicted even so that the institution of slavery would die out. Sadly, they were very wrong. Very wrong. Yeah, there was almost like this bubble of it's not it, we're going to change it. We're going to live up to these ideals in the Declaration. And then it's a like a very strong reversal. Um, and again, we'll go into that so deep in uh, the coming weeks as well. The last one, the debates over the slave trade clause. Yeah, so this, this is the international slave trade. This is the brutal trade of bringing Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States to become enslaved. Brutal, many died, many became sick, to say nothing of being taken from freedom into enslavement. It, and, and what you see at the convention is that even many slaveholding delegates are skeptic, are, are very critical of this practice. And so you have some voices in the convention saying, we need to give Congress the power to get rid of this practice right now. It needs to end. It's brutal. It's inhumane. It's, it's un-American in every way. Um, but on the other hand, you see key delegates from the Deep South, like John Rutledge of South Carolina, saying, I don't care what you think morally. This is in our economic and political interests. If you get rid of the international slave trade, we're out. We're leaving this convention and we're leaving the union. And so in the end, again, the delegates broker a compromise. And here what they say is, Congress will have the power to get rid of the international slave trade, but not until January 1st, 1808. So 20 years after the constitution goes into effect. And this had a huge practical effect, Curry. 20 years may not sound like maybe that much time in the grand scope of, of American history, but in that 20 years, another 200,000 people were brought over from Africa and enslaved here in the United States, which was only about 50,000 fewer than had been brought to the United States in the previous 170 years. So it had great practical effect. Yeah, and I remember reading um, just a couple of weeks ago about how it is for the southern states, it is more, they, in, they uh, enslaved more people in that 20 years than they had all the years and more leading up. So it's even in the southern states, it's much more concentrated too, because we're not seeing that enslavement as the northern states as much. Um, the graph on this is shocking as well. Great questions from the chat as we wrap up and kind of think about this constitutional convention and the, the, the job of the convention to set forth a national government, make these compromises and pull us all together in the compromises that they made, which Janelle made a really good point to kind of pulling that in the chat and everybody should read that. But Matthew's last question around that is before the convention, were there, um, were there black men having any political rights at the founding or before the founding? Uh, could they vote? Could they serve on juries? 
Yeah, I mean, there were certain states where free African Americans had political rights, so that 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 was certainly the case. Um, uh, but you know, in, in the end, it, it dwarfs anything in, in modern times that we would think is is you know appropriate or right. But there certainly were. Furthermore, you see very early, and we'll get into this in in, in future classes too. African Americans, even if they you know in, in certain parts, would take advantage of rights like the right to petition. So I think of. Prince Hall in Massachusetts in 1777, petitioning the Massachusetts legislature, he's a free African-American, saying basically live up to the Declaration of Independence and get rid of the institution of slavery here in Massachusetts. And so you see political activists in the African-American community from the very beginning. Unbelievable. And so this is an extremely interesting topic. It's an interesting week. And when we look at the Constitution and we celebrate the Constitution and all that it did, we also understand that there's some there's some issues and some tragedies in it as well. And that's what I love about diving into history. We understand and we look at the whole history and look at our celebrations and our mistakes all together so we can really truly understand it and its effects. So Tom, thank you so much for walking through it. Students, it was so amazing to have you in class today. Remember Friday is Constitution Day and we're going to be having a million programs on Friday. So if you need the listing of programs, check out our website. It's on our main page at constitutioncenter.org or just email me. I can always send them to you as well. And just tons of scholars, tons of civic ed leaders, tons of judges, and of course, a preamble reading with all the fifth graders in the country joining us. So thank you so much, Tom. Great class. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.